wonderful to be with you all. But I just want to start by introducing um, the topic. I've called it a little bit provocatively, but only half provocatively, is technology foresight and tautology, in the sense that I personally believe that technology is so pervasive and so impactful and more than ever that I wonder whether one can carry out foresight without looking very, very deeply at technology. And of course, all foresight includes a very strong focus on technology, but I'm talking about something which is far more prevalent and, and far more deep than just considering it amongst other factors. Anecdotally, I called my, my practice some years ago Tech Essential, which is basically technology and existential, because I believe that the capabilities and the strength of technology is so strong that it actually brings into question existential um, aspects. So I'll spend a few minutes with you giving you my perspective for what it's worth on technology foresight. I spent 20 years in investment banking as head of M&A for one of the big global banks advising companies on the most strategic deals and some of the VC fundraisings. I'm on a number of boards and work a lot with some of the VCs in the Valley here and as well as globally. So more recently, having professionalized in foresight, hopefully I can connect those dots. I think the first, the first area I just want to mention is one of, of semantics. I quite like um, a definition. There's a paper by Stephen Harwood and Sally E. Is, um, around conceptualizing technology, the development and future, and the six genres of technology. And um, forgive the what is not a typo, the S versus the Z, because it's a, it's a UK um, publication. But what's interesting in the definition they use for, for this paper is that they include words such as, you know, obviously human and artifact. They talk about both of them offering agency. They look at it as multidimensional and is it interwined. But they're looking at shifting beyond the artifact to embrace the complexity. And they're looking at the relationship between the artifact and the humans. And what I find very interesting is that they, they come up with effectively six genres for, for technology. The first one is one where effectively it's just humans. So effectively you have the humans um, reproducing and mating, maintaining themselves independently from any technology or, or let's call it artifacts to use the, the term of the authors. I personally question whether today you actually have any of human interactions without technology. I question whether um, there's any situation where we are disconnected entirely from technology and its influence. Um, and at number six, it's the opposite, where you only have the artifacts in the end where humans are cut out of the equation and you only have technological beings. And then you have various degrees in, in between. And so I think what's interesting is to is to look at the world in terms of, of some of those dynamics and some of the definitions. Um, the other reason why I personally find it quite interesting and important to think about technology in terms of quite pervasive is when you look at, obviously, Carlotta Perez and, and other eminent um, scholars, you can see that there's an element for some at least who believe that some of the cycles that one has are not only just correlated with financial cycles, but that actually Today, you know, if you take the different cycles, whether it was the age of railways or the production time, industrial eras, um, that today we are in more of a technology knowledge slash um, information era. And that is in effect a way of seeing the world and change and, and cycles themselves. And so of course, everyone around the, the globe and listening in is fully aware of how quickly and how converging the different technologies are but the, wor the one word I just want to emphasize here, and I know that um, Ant just talked about it moments ago in his own talk, is the word fusing. And I think that the fact that there's very um, strong acceleration of technologies, that they are continuously cheaper, faster, smaller, more powerful computing, the fact that they're converging, we know that, and these are digital synergies. But I think the area which we should not underestimate and which we have to understand that it's upon us today is really the fusing of these exponential technologies. And by fusion, I mean fusion between digital and biological. And therefore, you're looking at a bio-digital um, fusion. When you look at Internet of Things, we are in the area of Internet of Bodies as well. When you're looking at data or technology or information, 
you have that which is physical, which is implanted for some or swallowed or worn, whether you realize it or not, most of us probably are wearing um, technology. And even if we're not, this biometrics where you have everything we know, and not just in Asia, whether it's fingerprints, whether it's retina, whether it's just simply um, allowing your smartphone to switch on through facial recognition. And so this biodigital world is one which probably billions of us, if not the 7 billion on the planet, are living every day, however remote. And that is an area which to me means that you're really, to use um, Yuval Harari's terms, in a world where we're hackable and we are effectively that fusion with technology. And I'm not talking about necessarily transhumanism, I'm just talking about the everyday use of technology. Information is a good example. Information is really technology. Information, of course, covers all the, the letters of steep, whether it's um, societal by defining and tearing and polarizing society, whether it's the dissemination of the algorithms with the technology through the algorithms, whether you're monetizing every byte of data, whether the environment is suffering because of the soaring cloud footprint, or whether the political instruments and war 3.0, which we're experiencing every day in terms of disinformation. And so when you're looking at the power of what might not even look like technology, but actually is technology like information, I think more than ever, it's very important and very helpful to look at the stakeholder analysis matrix. In other words, we always do this for everything when we can in terms of who stands to gain. That's a, one of the fundamental elements we, we obviously um, carry out in our foresight work. But I think for technology in particular, and especially for areas which might not even appear blatantly as technology such as information, to really assess who are the stakeholders, who stands to gain. So here I've just adapted for illustrative purposes using you know, the ramifications of the future of information and using Kearns and Wright's um, approach for the stakeholder um, analysis. But, but effectively, I believe that a key part of technology is really thinking about that, who stands to gain and who are the bystanders, by, um, uh, bystanders et cetera. More, more traditional, if I may say, obviously is the, you know, the, the S-curve that most of us um, are extremely familiar with, of course. But I, I do find that it's important just as a reminder to, to think about that. And obviously there's a lot going on for, for, for us as much as possible around the weak signals and the more nascent, uh, the research, the scientific research, some of the emerging technologies, the fringe. So there's an element on the, on the sort of signal monitoring, if we can call it that, um, happening at the foresight. The lines are more and more blurred, I personally find, between academic foresight and innovation. I find, you know, I, sit, I spend a lot of time with, in Berkeley with the innovator, uh, innovation funds, with the accelerator, with the VC fund, um, with the academics. And I find that it's a good thing, actually, that the lines between academic research um, emergent technology and innovation and entrepreneurship are, are more and more blurred. So there's a lot of activity happening in that foresight zone, if we can call it that. One methodology which I find quite interesting to use and which, you know, again, most of you, many of you may be familiar with it, is um, NASA's technology readiness level. They've moved to make it more, I mean, it's, it's become more and more pervasive in terms of a uh, um, not being relevant just for space. And um, it's a good way I find of looking at the nine, you know, nine levels. So they define the ninth level as something which is effectively commercialized, operational, it's working, and you can have the AI home assistants or the avatars or social credit systems, um, which are eight or nine. And then at one, you might have really the beginning, the scientific research where the initial research is being translated into, into future research and future developments. Um, what's quite interesting is that at number one, you have the mind upload. Um, for some, like Ray Kurzweil, we have a sort of timeline of eight, nine years before achieving that, but it's, it's at one today, probably. Interestingly, Digiant, which is sentient entities that can learn and grow autonomously, um, they, are, they are at three. Uh, quite interestingly, by some analysis, and this is actually a partner of mine in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Lydia, 
who did this for, for an assignment um, with Envisioning, they put gene editing and CRISPR at severed, which I thought was quite interesting. Even more familiar with probably every single one of you is obviously the gardner hike cycle, but I think it's still nonetheless useful in terms of you know, doing the initial um, mapping and, and scanning of the signals to look at where we're at. So here you're, you're going through, and again, most of you will be intimately familiar with these, but um, from start to finish, where are you in the cycle for particular innovation before it becomes mainstream? And then with the different um, levels of, um, of maturity and commercialization of the different technologies. And here, I mean, you, you've seen a, a, these a hundred times, this is the latest for emerging technologies, but it's, it's always a good way of, of referencing. Like all these, these cycles and like all this, this kind of work, what's important is, is then for us to think about the tipping points. Um, I personally have not found it that easy the the really sort of pinpointing what what are the sort of the inflection points and what to look out for and i think that's where i think that the foresight work we do which is precisely not one of being a specialist technologist where we're looking just at an individual technology like gartner might do or some other specialist firms I think our role is to connect the dots and where we look much more broadly when we pick up the signals and then we understand where things stand in the, in the, in the cycle and then look beyond the technology and the maturity of the technology and connect the dots in ways where we might establish adoption or tipping points which go far beyond what may necessarily be just a technology assessment or a Gartner cycle assessment. And that is where I personally think that there's a lot of value, and I've certainly been enjoying over the past few years, is that focus on being much more um, broad than a lot of the technologists. And I, I quite like, actually, um, Lamberson and, and Scott Page, um, uh, Professor Page, who obviously spends a lot of time at the Santa Fe Institute on, on complexity, and most of, many of you will probably know his works on complexity, and um, I like the way he introduces in his def definition of tipping points, obviously the discontinuous jump, which we'll all be familiar with, but he, he looks at direct and indirect or contextual tips, and which may not necessarily be tipping points per se. So you can have upticks in adoption rates or other external factors where we connect the dots, which may in fact not necessarily be um, a point per se. And I think it's it's that is an area which I find particularly interesting in terms of looking more holistically um, at technology from a foresight perspective. Another piece which I which I found very very interesting as a as a framework, if I can call it that, is a paper re which recently Carla Creamer and and Jess um, Whittlestone from the UK um, published called Canaries in Technology Minds. Warning signs of transformative progress in AI. And um, Jess in particular, she, she's with the Center for Study of Existential Risk and, um, and uh, Carla is with the Future for Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. And, and coming back to my own personal way of framing these things, I find that the considerations around AI and technology progress, it's interesting that some of these papers are coming out of organizations like the Center for Existential Risk. Um, and this particular paper by Carla and Jess, they're looking at ways of identifying early warning signs that this transformative research progress in AI. And that is, you know, to, to sort of aid the anticipatory governance, but also they're looking at things which might have such a large impact on society and that are hard to reverse. And therefore we need to sort of be cognizant of that. And, and this I think is more holistic way of looking at things in terms of the impact on society and humanity than just the individual capabilities or technical assessments of a maturity of a technology. And so for instance, and, I, and we don't have time to, to go through much of the methodology and it's, it's an early paper they, they put out a few weeks ago, but they're looking at really um, different ways of having you know, um, these early warning sin signals and interpreting them. And one of the aspects of it, which is quite interesting, is that they're looking at the dependencies between in causal graphs, between the way the technology is impacting and 
um, looking at the causality, and then from that, looking at the patterns and where we're seeing the most um, interdependencies or connections um, and cause and effect to then think about the next order implications of that. And so while it's not structured in a way yet, probably because it's an early paper to, to be a formal framework, I think the concepts are very important. Just to wrap up, maybe, and not meaning to, um, <clears throat> to, to kind of blow my own trumpet, but I, I did spend a bit of time earlier this year, and, and our friends at the Journal of Future Studies were interested enough to, to publish a little piece, um, where I looked at the future of strategic decision making, and I, I used a, le- um, a framework at my end, which is looking at humanity and AI in terms of what is the decision-making value chain and where is AI at in relation to that compared to humanity? Because I feel that what is quite important is that AI is and, is, and machine learning is evolving quite fast. And the question I have is what is humanity doing and where for a particular task is humanity in terms of that decision-making? And so I use, you know, in this case, it's the intelligent, you know, if you think of the intelligence services and, and the value chain, you detect and you collect intelligence, you interpret it, and then you make and implement decisions. So you go from descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. And the question is at what point um, for what activities is a particular technology um, able to, to sort of carry out the decision making best? And today, What's sure is that the machines have an increasing role in the value chain. I think what is historically been a sort of optimization, automation game um, is quite fast moving to augmentation. Um, and that is, you know, that is very helpful for, for a number of things. And there's an element which is also creativity and the hyper augmentation. So for innovation and discoveries, which is very important for drug discovery and many other things. But AI is not as good with complexity today, primarily because complexity, as we all know, they are unknown unknowns um, and cause and effect is harder to determine for complexity. And therefore, AI is not as strong um, as pattern recognition and without the causality and with unknown unknowns. And therefore, today, complex systems is really where humanity thrives and where you need more judgment and where it's more of an emergent behavior. And I guess the question for me is, you know, as we wrap up, and, and it's a slight side conversation maybe, but is, you know, how quickly is AI or not able to move to decision making and to managing the more complex area? And what is humanity doing to make sure that we stay very strong in where we are today um, very legitimate and very strong. And so maybe just to to wrap up in that little paper I did for for the Journal of Future Studies, I then extrapolated, you know, very illustrative, um, you know, little scenario, which looked at the different options. If, you know, if we stay with hyper augmentation and, and, you know, using the sort of Sharp, Hodgson and Curry, you know, three, three time horizons, if you look at hyper augmentation and we're using the best um, synergies between AI and, and humanity, that's great. And, you know, you still have all the benefits of, of technology, but to be careful that we don't go from C-suite to, to A-suite for algorithm, um, where effectively the world becomes so complex and humanity doesn't upgrade themselves enough and machine learning starts becoming um, better at managing complex complexity and where that can, can evolve. And so the final comment I would have as I wrap up is, you know, what I tried to do over the past few minutes um, for what is normally a bit of a longer session is is go through the four phases I think about for technology foresight, which is, you know, elements of picking up the signals, which we talked about, looking at where we are in the cycle, for instance, whether it's NASA's um, TLR or the usual Gartner cycles and that trying to think about frameworks for for the tipping points and inflection points. And then obviously the next stage is to to connect all that and to think about, well, where's all that going? What are the next order implications and everything we we do every day as as foresight practitioners? So I just wanted to to leave you with that. Um, In a world where science fiction is becoming uh, more and more science fact. So thank you for having me. The questions we have are mainly uh, surrounding the idea that technology foresight has an impact on government and governmental decision making, but we want to know more about how to um, engage in technology foresight in government. So what is your view about this tension? 
uh, how to put it. I think there are a number of things. I think, first of all, <clears throat> most Western governments do not have an understanding of the unintended consequences and I thought or impact of uh, technology and are simply unable to do anything about it. Um, <clears throat> I think the main reason they're unable to do something about it is that the world is treating technology as known unknowns and causality and complicated to use Dave Snowden's terminology, as opposed to understanding that technology is complex in the sense of Dave Snowden, which means they, you don't know the cause and effect until it happens. There are interdependencies which are not well necessarily understood. Um, it's emergent. And therefore, even if you were to regulate and cut and change, you don't actually know into what technology is morphing because it is not like the telecom industries in the 70s when they regulated or the transport industry or oil and gas or infrastructure. You actually do not know what would happen it's like changing things in the Amazon in, in Brazil. You don't actually know the impact of that. So number one, I think governments are incapable of understanding what and how to go about it. I think the technology companies themselves don't have a full grasp of what they're doing, but they are more powerful than many people, um, than many of the governments. <clears throat> the second layer I would add is that, and not to name any countries here, they are very intentional um, parties who are ensuring that the Western democracies are polarized. It is not an accident that 2016, 2020 and Brexit elections are exactly middle of the road, 50-50. So the <clears throat> information is being productized, weaponized, exported by different states in a way that's, or, or parties. It is so easy to do that. And therefore the real question for me is really, if you think about um, technology or information, it's really an existential question around um, democracies. And you can see it. Why are people not wearing masks? Why are people not behaving in the right way in Western democracies? Basically, governments are unable to govern. There are certain parties who have succeeded in making society so polarized that the governments in Western democracies are simply ungovernable. UK, France, Europe. And so other countries which are better at doing it, either in a way which is maybe slightly more uh, with less uh, safeguards, let's call it, um, <clears throat> in Asia, do it very well. And other countries who have more compliant citizens like South Korea, Japan and that are not necessarily operating in an authoritarian way, but have compliant populations. And where you have Western democracies um, who don't have necessarily, you know, who believe they are free they are not being manipulated by tech companies and algorithms. They're being manipulated by geopolitical and tele technology um, um, and, te and uh, political technology. And it's very intentional and it can be done very cheaply by a very small number of people for different reasons who might be interested in having Western democracies weakened. And so for me, it does raise a lot of questions as to the future of democracies and uh, a lot of fundamental questions which go very, very far beyond just the regulation of technology companies.